Today, Apple announced their next generation of software products, and as expected, there was a lot of artificial intelligence mixed into that. If you're a photographer using an iPhone, Mac, Vision Pro, or other Apple devices, what's it going to mean for us? Let's break it down with the news, along with my insight on what it's really going to mean for those of us who care about imagery in the Apple world. All right, we're going to talk about Vision OS for the Vision Pro. We're going to talk about iOS, both for the iPhone and iPad. We're going to talk about Mac OS, and then we're going to talk about AI in general and where Apple is going with its AI plans. So let's start right off with the Vision Pro for some quick information there. As expected, they announced Vision OS 2, which had some things we expected and maybe some things we didn't. Nothing too revolutionary here. I thought it was interesting in the Photos app, they are going to put a spatial map on every photo and turn every 2D photo into a 3D photo. So my take on this is that this is similar to the lens blur feature that we saw added to Adobe Lightroom recently or the depth blur neural filter in Photoshop or the portrait bokeh feature in uh, Luminar Neo where they're analyzing the image attempting to identify what's kind of the foreground, middle ground, and background. And then, you know, in the photography applications, those third-party applications, they're doing that so that we can adjust the depth of field. Apple's going to be doing that so that it can simulate having multiple lenses looking at something in 3D. I expect we're going to see varying levels of success with this. And depending on the image, uh, when it works, it might be really impressive or it might be rather meh. I look forward to trying it out in the fall. Another feature they're adding to Photos in Vision OS is SharePlay, and this is Apple's ability to, uh, you know, share an experience with other folks uh, in your Apple ecosystem. And so this will let you share a panorama or other images with people so that they can view it uh, in an environment somewhat similar to your seeing with the Vision Pro headset. There are also some nice quality of life improvements to the Vision OS that I was expecting, uh, including updates to the home view. We can finally rearrange icons in the home view. Uh, and they've added some new gestures to quickly go to the home view, view the time and battery or the control center capabilities. So um, I'm looking forward to that. It is kind of interesting in that Apple is building out kind of some little uh, mini ecosystems when it comes to spatial video and immersive video. They talked about a new Canon EOS R7 spatial lens that will be coming soon. This is going to be a dual optic lens, so kind of two lenses in one, um, but specifically designed for capturing video for the Vision Pro. Those videos will be able to be edited in Final Cut Pro, and apparently they already have an arrangement where you can then share those videos out to Vimeo. It'll be interesting to see what that viewing experience looks like, and I guess that means Vimeo is still out there. That's a name I haven't heard in a while. They've also talked about immersive video, and in this case, they've partnered with Blackmagic uh, to essentially put together an immersive video pipeline to allow third parties to create immersive video. So this gets the kind of the, the big 3D wraparound experience on the Vision Pro. This will involve a Blackmagic camera uh, using DaVinci Resolve for the editing, not a big shocker there, and then Apple Compressor to render that out. One of the big things that's completely missing from any mention with Vision OS 2 in the keynote is any sort of native photo editing from Apple. Now, we've been able to use third-party apps on the Vision Pro for a while now. Um, I've actually got a video about that. I'll, I'll drop a card up above so you can take a look at that. Um, but yeah, you can use Lightroom or you can use uh, Photomator. Uh, basically, you're running the iPad versions of the apps in Vision OS, but they aren't Vision OS native. And Here's kind of my hot take on this at this point. For a long time, we heard that the iPad was a device that was for consumption and not creation. And I know the iPad enthusiasts hated that because they really wanted to do creation with it. But we seem to kind of be seeing the same thing play out here with the Vision Pro. Apple doesn't seem enthusiastic about letting us create on the device or even edit the things that we've created elsewhere. Is this the same story again? 
Let's move on to iOS, which most definitely is for creation. Um, and I don't think there's any disagreement there. So with photos on iOS in iOS 18, which will be the version that comes out this fall, uh, they announced this is the biggest redesign ever of the photos app, which a phrase like that can make me a little bit nervous. It's like, did I lose everything that I once knew? Am I going to have to relearn something entirely different? The good news is it's still pretty darn familiar. They've reorganized it instead of having several different pages you have to switch between. Now they've got the photo grid up top and organized stuff down below. And that organized stuff is now being called collections. So shout out to those of us old school Flickr folks who are used to having uh, collections, keeping track of our albums. Now we can have that on our Apple device as well. So collections are intelligent groupings. Some of these are going to be familiar if you've already used Apple Photos. It's things like, you know, people and pets or places that you've been or your favorites photo album. The people view now has groupings. So in addition to easily finding photos of individual people, you can find photos from common sets of groups. So for example, every photo of you and your spouse together or every photo of your entire family. Some of these collections are going to be new with iOS 18. So they have one called Recent Days, which shows you all of your photos for the last several days, group by day. And they've said this is also going to take out uh, what they referred to as clutter. They used uh, receipts as an example if you'd taken photos of receipts. So I was excited to see that with all of these intelligent collections, they are going to let us manually reorder them. So if there are particular types of collections that you use all the time or that you rarely use at all, you're going to be able to prioritize or deprioritize those in your Photos app so that it's as efficient as possible for you. Within the photo grid view, there's a new filter button that brings together some things that were in different places in the past with Apple Photos. It's where you can filter by aspect ratio if you want to group all your you know, landscape photos or portrait photos. Uh, it's also where the media type groupings are now. So um, they showed an example in the keynote of how to hide the screenshots, for example, if you don't want to see those in your photo collection. Outside of the Photos app, I do want to touch on something else that is very visual with iOS 18, um, and that they've made some updates to the iPhone home screen. And so you can move icons around kind of wherever. If you wanted to leave the middle of your screen blank and have icons up top and icons down below, you can do that. It looks like they're still snapping them to a grid, so it's not completely freeform willy-nilly, uh, but this should give you some nice flexibility. One of the examples in the keynote was showing how you could move your icons so that you could see more of your wallpaper. Uh, that's always been something that, you know, I've chuckled about is like people get really excited about personalizing the wallpaper on their phone, but the reality is it's usually covered up with a bunch of icons and stuff. The other thing that they introduced, and this one seems like it might be a little controversial, is a new color tint customization. And this will allow you to put a common color aesthetic across all of the app icons on your phone. So if you want everything to look blue or orange or yellow, you can do that. Uh, some of the developers are a little cranky about it. I saw Daniel Jowcutt, who's a pretty well-known iOS developer, say that he feels it you know, we'll let people make uh, his app icon look, you know, less than visually pleasing. So I'm curious, is this something you think you're going to use? Are you going to even check it out? Drop a comment below and, and let me know, because I'm curious. Uh, my take is I probably won't even try it, but that's just me. We're going to see the same updates that come to iOS for the iPhone come to iPad OS as well. So it's going to get the same photos updates. It's going to get those same home screen customization abilities. Onto the Mac. The next version of Mac OS is named Sequoia. And photos were mentioned when it came to the Mac OS updates. It was almost an afterthought. Uh, it's going to get the new collections capabilities. It's going to get some new search features that uh, I'll talk about here in just a moment. Um, but they didn't really demonstrate anything specifically about photos on Mac OS this time around. So, so as expected, Apple made a bunch of AI announcements. And also as expected, they branded it Apple Intelligence, which plays well with the AI acronym and also fits conveniently within the naming schemes that Apple's been using for things lately. 
Now, as a company with strong ethos around protecting user information and privacy, Apple needed to move into the AI world in a way that fits within those ethos and in a way where they can tell that story of how they're differentiating themselves from some other AI companies that perhaps have uh, had a series of missteps when it comes to ethics and privacy over the last few years. CEO Tim Cook came right up front and said they had five points of emphasis as they crafted Apple intelligence. It needed to be powerful, intuitive, integrated, personal, and private. And as they rolled through these things, we can see how they emphasize different bits of that throughout the presentation. Now, it is interesting to note all of the talks about Apple intelligence very clearly called out that this is going to work on iOS, iPad OS, and Mac OS. They called out that it's going to work with your iPhone, your iPad, and your Mac. Nothing about Vision OS. Much like with wondering how I can't edit my photos on Vision OS with Apple software, I'm a little concerned here that Vision OS seems to already kind of be an afterthought or a second-rate platform in Apple's mind. Vision OS is new enough that certainly... It should have been part of these discussions as they build towards this AI platform. And the fact that there is nothing about Apple intelligence on Vision OS is going to make Vision OS seem pretty limited when we start getting used to a lot of these features being built into our iPhones and our Macs. So as we know, AI capabilities use a lot of computing power. That's one of the big reason why most AI platforms are all cloud computing platforms, right? You don't run ChatGPT locally on your computer, you run it through ChatGPT servers, for examples. So Apple introduced that uh, the architecture for Apple Intelligence is going to run on the A17 Pro, which is their latest Uh, iPhone chip, uh, along with M-series Mac processors. So the M1, M2, M3, and M4. Older hardware will not be able to run Apple Intelligence natively on the device. And speaking of running it on the device, a lot of the AI models do run on the device. So where they can process the information locally, they will. Now, not everything can be done on the device, though. So as powerful as Apple's chips are, they still aren't quite powerful enough to do some of the computing calculations that are needed for these AI features. And so Apple has built out private cloud computing with Apple Silicon servers that will send the data up to Apple's data centers if needed to provide some of this calculations. It sends only the data that's needed. The data is not stored by Apple and uh, they're being very upfront in wanting to keep privacy and security forefront in that the software used to process all this data, they're promising transparent software inspections so that uh, people will be able to know what is this software really doing? How do I know that it's being kept private? And I'm not just having to trust some company that, you know, says what they're going to do and we hope they do it. Now, the Apple intelligence features they announced include a bunch of writing features. There's image features. There's more. I'm going to focus on the photography and image things because there's plenty to look at right there. One of the big choices Apple has made is that they're offering three different types of images that can be generated when you're using the generative image features of Apple intelligence. Sketches, illustrations, and animations. Big thing missing there, they haven't mentioned photos. So by not trying to generate photorealistic images, Apple is eliminating a lot of problems that they might otherwise have to deal with and that other platforms are dealing with. If I can't generate a photorealistic image, I can't generate a photo deepfake or a video deepfake. It makes it hard to do any sort of photo deception with their platform if the images that are being generated aren't photos. So I like what they've done there. And if you like how I'm handling this video, hit that like button down below to let YouTube know that I'm a likable guy. So one of the other things they showed is Genemoji, which allows you to generate an emoji. They showed this in messages. You can use it throughout the system. It can be based on a photo. So you could create an emoji for your friend that looks like your friend. 
I'm not really thrilled with the name of Genmoji, but I've never really been thrilled with putting Gen on the beginning of other AI terms either. I didn't like Gen Erase when Luminar Neo came out with that tool as that name. And how awkward is it if your name is Gen? But Apple is allowing for image generation within a new app that's also a feature. So it's a standalone app, but it can also be used within other pieces of software called Image Playground. And the idea with Image Playground is that you start with a theme or a costume or a place or a concept, something you want to do, and it starts generating some ideas for you. You can then refine that. You can uh, add additional things in. You can say what you like, say what you don't like. They called out specifically that this eliminates the need to create a very complex or uh, custom prompt in that uh, that's one of the big barriers to AI and getting started for a lot of people, I think, is that they're trying to figure out how do I create a prompt that really gets to what I want to get to. Now, you can also give it a little bit of a text prompt. So if you know specifically what you want to add into your, your generated image, you can do that. The thing that's interesting about Image Playground to me is that it will create suggestions based on the personal context that it has and that it's running in. So because it's running on your device, it knows who your contacts are. It knows what's on your calendar. It knows maybe when you've got tickets for a concert. It knows what's in your photo library. And this is both the super powerful and the super scary part of artificial intelligence. And this is why a company like Apple is hopefully gonna become a trusted partner with folks. Because with that personal context, you know, it's not generating an image from scratch. It's generating an image based on your world. And this image playground tool is initially going to be available in the Apple apps built into the operating system, but it's also available for third party developers to use by integrating it with their software using an API. In related, they also have a tool called image wand, which will let you uh, translate a rough sketch into a final image. So you can sketch out you know, a rough idea of maybe what you want. And it uses that as a starter for Image Playground to generate a more complete image. You could also have something, let's say in Apple Notes, and use the magic wand and select a blank area. And then it'll start pulling context from what's around it, right? I, I definitely had thoughts of how generative fill works in Adobe Photoshop, where you select the area where you want to fill and then give it a prompt to fill in. Well, in this case, instead of having to give it a prompt, it's going to use, you know, and by it, I mean Image Playground on Apple's platforms, it's going to use the context of what else is in that note to figure out what you might want there. Adobe uses context for things like lighting and integrating its generative stuff into the finished image. Apple's going to use the context to help you build whatever's being generated. Now, there's some exciting new stuff in the Apple Photos app that I haven't mentioned previously, and this is integration with Apple intelligence and with some AI capabilities. So, Natural language search is here. They gave an example of find all the images or find an image of Maya skateboarding in a tie dye shirt. Now it's interesting. Natural language search was one of the things that I talked about when I wrote my book on AI and photography a few years ago. There's a link down below if you want to check that out. You know, this really is the future of photo search. Metadata is a stopgap. That manual work of, uh, adding and updating metadata is going away because AI is getting smarter. With Apple bringing natural language search into Apple Photos, that's a big step forward for a very big platform. And it's going to make applications that don't have natural language search yet presumably help you catalog your images. They're going to look pretty dated pretty quickly. I'm looking at you, Adobe Lightroom and Capture One and some of those other big players. Now that natural language search in Apple Photos also works for videos as well. So if you get a video of Maya falling off the skateboard, you could presumably search for that also. 
Now those natural language capabilities, they didn't demonstrate this particular example, but I did catch it on one of the slides where they had an example of a quote, make this photo warmer. So if they're offering up natural language photo editing, well, that's pretty cool. So there's a lot of possibilities here. I mean, but how cool would it be if, you know, instead of manually interacting with a bunch of tools to get what you want, you could just bring up an image and say, give me a square crop of this photo with the face in the center of the image. I think that's pretty cool. They also showed off an AI powered memory movie maker. Um, so you can bring together images around a particular event or scene or person or things like that and put that together into a cute little uh, a movie that you can share. Uh, it included music suggestions as well. They did reiterate with their photo and video AI things that their photo and videos are not shared with Apple. Now, it wasn't all sunshine and computer generated rainbows. One thing that I think was interesting is something that they didn't talk about at all in that the environmental aspect of artificial intelligence was not talked about at all, not a single word. Um, for a company that in you know the past months and last couple of years has really hit hard on their climate goals, you know, and has had included lectures from Mother Nature as part of their keynote videos. I'm trying to figure out how this all plays together. I mean, how does this impact Apple's climate goals? If you go look at Apple 2030, which is their environmental plan, there's a link down below if you want to go check that out. It's very product focused, right? It talks about the environmental impact of the iPhone and the Mac and, you know, their different product offerings. But how do services fit into that? I mean, we know that Apple Silicon is pretty power efficient, right? That's one of the reasons that they went off in that direction. But this cloud processing that they're going to be doing is surely going to have an impact the cloud processing or the processing that had to happen to build the LLMs and build these machine learning models definitely has an impact as well. And I would love to have Apple talk about that impact as part of their narrative around artificial intelligence. Now, I'll also mention kind of as a footnote, and it was kind of in the footnote position in Apple's keynote as well, they are adding the ability for Siri to be an interface to chat GPT. But to me, that's not really exciting to the things that it can do with my information on my phone. They said that this is AI for the rest of us, and I think that's a good take. It's not AI for AI's sake, but it's AI to help us get things done. It's not going to replace our creative efforts necessarily, but it's going to augment what we're already doing with our phones, our tablets, our computers, are you excited for these updates, which we should see later this year? iOS, iPad OS, Mac OS, they typically come out in the September, October timeframe. Did anything surprise you? Was there something you were hoping to hear or something you thought you were going to hear that you didn't hear? Drop a comment below and let me know. I'm kind of curious. I'm curious how you think these various updates are going to impact how you're using your Apple devices for capturing and working with photography or videography as the case may be. So fun times ahead. Looking forward to it. Subscribe to the channel to come along and I'll talk to you later.